You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. I hope this podcast finds you well. Welcome to our fourth story for the month of February 2023, issue 197. As always, whether this is your very first story that you're listening to or it's over something like 750, I actually have to do that count because I have no idea. But we've been doing this for a very, very long time. And the best part is that we can't be doing it without you. So thank you for your ongoing support, whether you're listening, whether you're telling a friend, whether you're subscribing to the magazine, or whether you're going to patreon.com forward slash Clark's World and checking us a dollar a month or more. Thank you. We simply could not do it without you. Our story is titled An Ode to Stardust and is by R.P. Sand. R.P. Sand, who can be found at the website rpsand.com, is a theoretical physicist turned scientific advisor for literature and film, science communicator and educator, and writer of speculative fiction whose words have made the Locust recommended reading list. Cats, coffee, cosplay, and colorful socks are a few of her favorite things. And if you like what you hear, go back to The Last Civilian and Ask the Fireflies. So, my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. My cat hops up to his favorite spot by the window to observe the nebula, the pitter-patter of his paws and the low hum-rumble of the engine, the only sounds in the room. Misty tendrils amble past, glimmering and cloud-like, carrying an entire medley of warm hues, and his black coat is gilded with a lambent pink. Midnight's tail flicks the way it does when I wind up one of his mice. I envy his contentment. I allow myself an unworried moment to imagine his thoughts, pawing a star, perhaps, or snatching a fish from the great cosmic sea. Better to ruminate on Midnight's fancies than face the task before me. The lump in my throat surges, and with it, the pain that racks my limbs. I sigh, turning back to the metal ceramic slab that is my desk and the countless balls of paper that litter it. The desk protrudes from a metal ceramic wall, mirroring the protrusion across the room that holds my mattress. It strikes me how unimaginative our starships are, despite the alloy filigree and decorative trimmings, compared to the nebula where we anchor and to the glory of the cosmos beyond. I examine the sheet I've been writing on, primed with empty, useless words. Blistered earth, I grumble, then crumple it up and hurl it against the wall. My joints protest. Midnight doesn't flinch at the movement. He's fixated on the sight beyond, occupied by his carefree cat thoughts. The tear tracks on my cheeks are dry now, and they itch. I scratch at them before pulling out another sheet. The waste isn't lost on me, but I blame my lack of articulation and not my decision to use real paper for a personal touch. It's the least I can do. I simply need to find the right words. But how can one really ever find the right words to tell someone their granddaughter is dead? And that, too, someone who isn't human at all. I met Bik Bik the day I landed on the moon, I couldn't know then what she would become to me. The moon was a barren and cavernous piddly hunk of rock called Mark X-52 on the fringe of the archipelago. Yes, but it was my barren and cavernous piddly hunk of rock. I disembarked from my transport in a freshly minted station commander uniform, hair tightly braided down my back, wearing a cool expression to mask the turmoil within. This was a dream. This was all a dream. I would wake up at any moment and revert to the nothing I was. But despite my qualms, I did not wake up and was received as Commander Tara Jaxing with all the pomp and grandeur befitting a new moon base leader. Everything that seemed an impossible fancy when I was a child running barefoot and pain-free on the sands of Rhea 09. See it in my ankles. Howling with glee, chased by a singing father. When midnight stars ignite the skies, you're still the brightest in my eyes. Papa's song often lurked at the edge of my consciousness. Oh, thinking of him brought no joy, springing forth entirely unbidden when I felt most vulnerable. It wasn't a surprise that his voice stirred now amidst my doubt-laced churning thoughts, the daunting formalities, the wary looks at my back. 
I was the youngest station commander in history, and these new subordinates of mine thought I couldn't see their blistering glances. Eventually, I found myself alone in personal quarters twice the size of my entire childhood home, with only the station's mainframe for company. I surveyed the rooms, clenching the handle of my soul bag, fighting to ignore familiar aches that crawled my limbs, my palpitating heart, the thrums of a headache, all exacerbated by travel and ceremony, and a stinging feeling that I may as well have walked around naked for how exposed I felt. I couldn't figure out where to sit. A vast bed, multiple couches and floor pillows, and even the four chairs at my table seemed overkill. I wryly wondered if I could petition one of my new assistants to switch quarters with me, perhaps that second one who would double as my private pilot. Seemingly amiable, one of the few who didn't frown when I wasn't looking. What was their name? Zaff, I thought. When midnight stars ignite the skies, you're still the brightest in my eyes. Again, those words in that tune... But rather than shake them vehemently from my head, as was my instinct, I found myself in the strange, silent, cold room, yearning for a sight I hadn't seen in years. Uh, mainframe? Yes, Commander. Please set the view to Sukun Beach on Rea Onine, I said. The flinty moon view from the bay window swooshed into an expansive sea lapping against russet sands. Sunlit coconut trees swayed in the breeze, as if to a tune only they could hear. A lone jade albatross soared. Home. Though I wasn't sure I deserved to call it that anymore. How many years had it been? Nonetheless, the sight eased the tension in my temples, and the room felt a smidge less cold. People in circles I now traversed would laugh if they discovered I sought comfort in viewing a substandard planet. Rhea class, agricultural, good for nothing more than populating richer planets' tables. I unpacked my sparse belongings in mere minutes, then lay awkwardly on my bed in an attempt to mollify the aches that ravaged my joints. A ping came through one of my assistants, politely conveyed through the mainframe with an internal message, Commander. Open at your earliest convenience. A delegation of the moon's natives, who mined our luminite, had arrived. Slugs, or so we called them, because their guttural language was difficult to emulate by human vocal cords. Eslugai is what they call themselves, loosely translated to stardust. My heart quaked more than it had the day thus far, and before I left, I smoothened my uniform two, three, ten times, I'd never met a slug before, though I'd seen plenty of footage and examined a corpse back at the academy. There was something about them that unsettled me, and it wasn't the way they had scales instead of skin or how they were elongated and many-limbed with sculpted faces that seemed hewn by some unearthly craftsperson. It was more so their entire being. They were by nature docile, affable, perfectly consistent, I suppose I couldn't really fathom a sentient race that was not only predictable, but preferred functioning as a collective rather than being individualistic and calculable, sans politics and social divides and personal agendas. Not when I had such trouble with my own cold people and hospitable to the chronically ill. I had to fight to get where I was, surmount human-made obstacles, counter stereotypes about those of us deemed second-class citizens, downplaying where I was born and hiding the incessant pain that afflicted me since grade school. Slugs simply made me uncomfortable. The greeting hall sat adjacent to my office, specially tailored to receive slugs, with a door to the outside marking it as theirs. Five slugs awaited, perched on slabs of moon rock. Our couches and chairs did not account for their size or limbs. It struck me that cameras did not do them justice at all. No footage I'd seen captured how scintillating their scales were, nor how intricately detailed their faces and protruding fanged maws. Their scales shared pink and purple undertones, but the iridescent swirls and star-like speckles that caught in the light seemed unique to each one. Some had highlights of olive and orange like sunset sloshing over palms, other a montage of silvers and blues that reminded me of the sea's infinite moods. The only slug I encountered in person had been dead, and when slugs die, their scales fade to gray. I admit my breath caught the moment I glimpsed them in the greeting hall, though with awe came fresh waves of anxiety and even intimidation. 
They were only a few heads taller than I, but in their polychromatic majesty they seemed to tower over me. I wanted to run. Instead, I said, It is my pleasure to hear you, and what I hoped was a sing-song voice adhering to the protocols I learned as a cadet. Important for cooperation to heed their customs, read one of my myriad textbook margin notes. The five hummed back in pleasant union, and goosebumps flecked my arms. Unsha. 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 The closest one to me crept forward off their perch. A pleasure greatly to hear you, they said in the gato tone that rumbled over human words. You call me Wahlu, Queen of Eslugai, and I welcome your voice as new dearest station leader. Ah, queen, right. Single gender society, selected pronoun translation, human she's believe they're the only ones unaware of fellow slugs on other mining moons. The notes flipped through my mind's eye as if I'd written them yesterday. This is Bibik, my apprentice, to be queen one day, daughter of my second daughter. A smaller slug to her left nudged forward shyly, though there was a playful twinkle to her black pearlescent eyes. This one had more pink to her purple, a twinge of lustrous yellow, and her four palms widening and greeting. I bowed slightly, first to Walu and then to Bikbik. -Bik. Thank you and greetings to you, Walu, and to you, Bikbik. -Bik. The slugs fidgeted a little, failing to suppress giggles at my botched pronunciations of their peculiar names. I think our pronunciations are cute, like two arms and bland skin. I pretend not to notice and staved off the urge to flee by turning to business and reminding myself that I was the one with the true authority here. In the meeting that followed, I'd entertained supply requests, established a handful of new rules I concocted during my journey, and praised them for an exceptional job of mining the luminite that powered our starships, among other things. They pretended at the last bit, as I knew they would. Slugs take great pride in their work and in their being essential to us, and it didn't hurt to throw them a bone from the outset. In any case, the praise was genuine, and the reports I read in preparation for this role, they'd consistently exceeded their targets. As the meeting drew to a close, Walu voiced an additional request. She had worked closely with my predecessor, and it was her wish that as part of Big Bic's training, the young slug would work closely with me. You share newness, Walu said with a smile. My assistant opened the slug door and began to direct them outside. Much to learn from each other, yes? It was Big Big who first bridged our divide. I'm ashamed to admit that had she not, the Sunderance would have likely remained, would have even grown stronger perhaps over time, melding with distances I cast between myself and my own kind. I was a fish out of water, entering this role with all the naivete of a child who assumed that once her dreams came true, she'd be happy, feel accepted, belong. But instead I agonized over each decision, weighing choices against my predecessors or what I felt station commanders on other mining moons would do. I subdued my own preferences, at least those sure to be countered by cynical frowns, altering my actions, words, and expressions to what I hoped befitted the commander of an entire mining operation. The daily briefings, for instance, where department heads made their reports to me were conventionally held first thing in the morning, yet my mornings were excruciating affairs. I'd wake up in a tangle of tender joints, craving solitude and silence as the foggy disorientation from fitful sleep faded. I always worked better from afternoon to night, but if I requested briefings to be moved to afternoons, I'd be met with raised eyebrows and snide remarks, and so I simply powered through, veiling aches behind intense coffee and a stoic visage, lest I be considered a lazy youth. My indomitable need to be perceived as flawless and normal was fiercer than ever, and frustratingly I discovered it extended even to slugs, which of course included Big Big. We spent more time together... Than I would have liked. But I was no stranger to discomfort, and so I masked, masked, masked. Uh, just as I hid headaches behind chirpy smiles, muscle spasms with a spring in my step, so I greeted the alien as though one would a lifetime acquaintance. 
Inside the station, we met in the greeting hall, or the slug sections of the medical dome, the only places where her kind were permitted, and she'd pelt me with question after question, curious about humans, our habits, our quirks, our rituals, like morning coffee, evening fika, and sweets after meals. Outside, she accompanied our mine inspections, running excruciatingly detailed commentaries about the mining process I already knew from my academy days. Her words slid over my ears, but I nodded along, donning a polite smile. All the while, warily eyeing the slugs that spangled the multi-leveled mine interiors. Spots of psychedelic luster among colossal stalagmites, stalactites, and winding pathways that seemed traced by some gigantic finger. An uncomfortable, steady hum emanated from the slugs. It loosened the luminite, they claimed, willing the moon to offer its gifts more readily, thus decreasing risk. I didn't know whether this was true, or that the suffusing tone served as a reminder of how many there were. It made no difference to my somersaulting gut that there were humans, too. Humans who oversaw their slug crews, my own security detail and Zaff, who insisted on following me around despite my protests. My party comprised of three booming roadsters overwrought with humans, and yet... All I could think, as I nodded courteously to Bick Bick's words, was a hundred of these slugs could close in around me, smother me, sing me to death, and there wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. I hated myself in those moments, acutely aware that commandeering a mining moon was exactly what I'd worked so hard for. Luminite was the backbone of the archipelago, powering terraformers. Artificial habitats and starships enabling interplanetary travel amongst its vast distances. The command was a staggering honor. But apparently, no amount of nose burying in books was enough to make me feel comfortable around slugs. They remained a stark, daunting unknown. Unlike humans who I knew to keep at bay, Tara's so flaky, Tara's a goody two-shoes who never goes out, Tara cares only for high scores, Tara's like an old woman... Friends became acquaintances and strangers when you said no one too many times by offering frail excuses to conceal a sickness that made you work twice as hard to maintain your place. The hurt was all the more exacerbated by a father who never believed you were in pain, who believed you dreamed too big for your boots, who clung to the phantom of a healthy child running across the sands. Well, I'd shown him. A few weeks into my post, we toured as per usual, Bick Bick with her rambling commentary, our roadsters burrowing through mines. This time I had hardly paid heed to her at all. My mind reeled in the aftermath of a meeting with my boss, Mining General Patel Cruz. He seemed to check in on me more frequently than my peers. I was convinced he regretted appointing me so young. Every time his hollow projection sat before me, self-efficacies crept into my thoughts, and so I'd fumble words, laugh at inopportune moments, fidget with my waist-length braid, after each meeting, I'd slump, mentally pacing over each sentence exchanged, straining to identify how better I could have articulated this and that. This time, my thoughts persisted over a moment when I conveyed some ideas a little too animatedly. His simulacrum frowned in confusion at my zest-laced words, and in my enthusiasm, I completely forgot those very ideas had been attempted long before I took this post. I wanted to shatter into a million pieces to be carried far, far away by a relentless wind. Papa's face loomed in my thoughts, sun-kissed and stern, though I hadn't spoken to him in ages. I told you so, no? Too big for your boots. New path is coconut farming like mine. Tara's no good at anything. It is a bounce back, a back bounce Bick Bick was saying. She looked at me expectantly, cautiously, and with that playful twinkle in her eyes. Hmm? She waved upward. I suddenly noticed a lack of clamor from our wheels and how the slug humming seemed farther away. We'd come to a halt, beneath and a little ways away from a darkened shaft that could have been gouged by a Herculean spiral screw, even though it was naturally occurring. Your song comes back, she said as if that were ample explanation. My confusion seemed to exasperate her. She scrambled over the side of our vehicle and headed for steps extending to a ledge beneath the shaft. I exhaled and blinked, grounding myself back to the present and away from my rumination. Fresh anxiety sprouted from the soil of my thoughts. 
What was she doing? We never stop like this during our tours. But I watched as she paused halfway to shoot me an expectant look with big, eager eyes waving an inviting palm. <sighs> Whatever. I'd already made a fool of myself in front of Patel Cruz. Following Big Bic would either only prove I was worthless or I could redeem myself. In that moment, I decided to take a leap of faith. I climbed out of the roadster, dispelling objections from my human entourage. Zaf even tried to block my way. The mines aren't safe. You should leave this place, they hissed, by ordering them to remain behind in the vehicles. Though small for her kind, Big Pic was still over a head taller than I, and glided with ease over the broad steps. By the time I reached the ledge, my knees screamed and my skull thrummed, but I clamped my teeth into my lower lip and simply pretended the pain did not exist as I had always done. I could collapse later, safely in my quarters away from scrutinizing eyes. I opened my mouth, but she thwarted my unspoken question with a raised hand, lifting her maw to the dark depth, and began to sing. Ayanao. Baritone notes careen smooth as butter into higher and higher pitches. Ayanao. And then she fell silent, waiting, waiting. I held my breath. Ayano, Ayano. The melody returned from the depths of the shaft, ten times stronger, swallowing me like a spirited tide. I gasped and stumbled back. The melody returned again and again, fainter with each reprise until the tide faded into gentle laps and finally... Silence. Echoes. That's what she wanted to show me, except they were quite unlike any I'd ever heard. I must have been gaping like a fool because she laughed. Understood? Your song comes back. Later I learned that Walu berated her granddaughter for wasting my time with frivolous nonsense. I was a station commander, for goodness sake, but I disagreed with the queen. For it was in this moment that I first felt a modicum of comfort in being drawn outward, away from the perennial torrent within. There's tranquility in turning inward, even if riddled with cataclysmal thoughts and pain. I'd never really been comfortable with external forces, but now? Something in those dulcet tones and the way Big Big's eyes flared with sheer delight hailed me. I did not join in song, well, not then, but I studied the face I'd seen dozens of times before as she coasted into another tune, and I saw a softness in those very colored scales and angles I had noticed before. My cat, Midnight, is here because of Big Big. Who knew I could draw such fierce soothing from something extrinsic as a pet? Once he entered my life, I couldn't imagine how I'd ever lived without him. Caring for him feels to me as though I am a part of something bigger, as odd as that may sound. I now always have unwavering reason to rise from bed. Walu extended numerous invitations to visit their caldera, an expansive crater framed by flinty hills and caves spilling into the moon's surface from caverns below. The invites were not entirely unexpected, it were a formality to be politely declined, which I did austerely as did the leaders who came before me, and somehow after the unexpected glimpse into their world through Big Big's echoes, I grew curious. What else didn't we know about them? We knew their robust scaled physiologies were better than ours for mining luminite, though our processes still weren't without risk for them and led to the occasional accidental death. We knew they enjoyed their work, congregated in the caldera at the end of the day before retiring to their caverns, turned gray when they died, and attributed importance to sounds, but not much else. After the fifth invitation or so, I finally thought, well, truly, why not? I fancied myself a pioneer. 
If I learned more about the Aslugai, if I forged even closer relations with them, perhaps I could improve operations in a way that resulted in unprecedented amounts of luminite dispatched in record times. I could become one of the most celebrated station commanders in history. And so I accepted and soon found myself sipping an oddly sweetened yet pleasing stew around a communal fire that crackled starward with cerulean or purple or lime flames whenever a spoonful of paint was tossed into it. Three crooning eslugai ground byproducts of luminite into fluorescent pigments. To reduce wastage, Walu explained, and to color flames or paint luminescent frescoes on cave walls and stone floors. I hadn't known about this at all. Only that byproducts were dumped into a gorge not far from their caldera, and promptly ignored by us humans. I dipped a cautious finger into one of the bowls and returned it alight in viridescence as though it were backlit. Eslugai children scampered around the fires, squealing whenever flames flared with fresh color, chasing after pebble ferrets, so-called because they looked like old earth ferrets with pebbly fur. Zaf lurked anxiously nearby, and beyond them my human entourage stood reticent with my roadsters. The pigment maker's croons, the children's laughter, the crackles from fires speckling the caldera, all made for such a novel, gratifying, immersive symphony under the amber glow of the gas giant we orbited that I regretted not accepting Walu's invite sooner. And so, when my visit drew to an end and Bik-Bik voiced her wish to see where I resided, the thought came once more. Well, truly, why not? In time, I smuggled her into my quarters, the first Eslugai in a human-only area, my assistants all dispatched on inane errands, even Zaf. She slowly circuited the room, noting each detail, as if it were the most fascinating thing she'd ever seen, before we settled onto floor pillows for Fika. It was then she made a comment casually tossed but core striking nonetheless, the catalyst that brought midnight into my life. Such expanse for just one. No wonder you live perpetually in your head. I glanced about at the emptiness of my quarters. I... I do not care for it, I relented. I avoided her questioning gaze and poured from a teapot gilded in bronze, depicting sunflowers, an elephant said to have dwelled on old earth. Don't you feel the loneliness? I'd somehow expected this question. Her people slept skin to skin in their collective. Isolation was unthinkable but it still gave me pause, my cup halfway to my lips. Was I lonely? I had been a child with one eye on the stars, and I had been a child with chronic pain, an odd guppy on our little island that existed solely to farm coconuts on a little planet that existed solely to cultivate food. You should spend your time learning the way of the land or tumbling outside with other children, not studying math or lounging in bed with so-called... Headaches, Papa would say. You really think someone like you could become an engineer? Think, Lado, think. What will you do after I'm gone? I suppose in his own way he thought he protected me from a heart broken by pointless dreams, because no one ever left our little corner of the archipelago. But all it did was forge a rift that magnified with each passing year. It was me against him. Me against the world. Even after I was accepted into the academy, even after he cried jubilant tears when I boarded the schooner that whisked me away to a grand starship in my new life, I could not forgive how insignificant he made me feel, nor could I, in my new life, become myself. I donned an unyielding resolve to mask, further solidified when I witnessed the plight of another cadet during my second year. I do not even remember her name, only that she was never quite the same after a crash despite our world-class facilities. She couldn't keep up, and it wasn't that she was met with hostility, only that allowances weren't made for her. I mean, of course they weren't. And things simply ran their course. There were times she faded from a rambunctious overachiever into a hollow ghost who slinked through the corridors in desperate search of a hand to pull her from the dark depths. There were none. Last of all, from me, for fear that my own struggles be discovered. 
Last I heard, she failed and never returned. I refused to become her. I resisted any semblance of connection because I did not have the trust nor energy to cultivate genuine relationships. So in a way, I'd always been lonely. I just got used to it. I didn't say any of this, of course. Bic Bic searched my face as I scrounged for the right words. And I hoped my thoughts were opaque to her. Can you not have a friend like a... a... She made a sound in her language, clearly having forgotten our word for it. She skittered a hand across a cushion. A pebble ferret? Pebble ferrets, like Eslugai, were native to the moon. We mustelids that Bic Bic's people considered animal companions, though they weren't domesticated. Bic Bic nodded enthusiastically. For a moment, I imagined my traipsing through the station's corridors with a pebble ferret, with a cacophony of pebble ferrets, with an entire animal retinue that would be the envy of zoos across the archipelago, and nearly laughed. I'm only the most scrutinized station commander ever, probably. I think I've stirred up enough of commotion by existing, why stir up more? I smiled so she'd know I hadn't taken offense at her suggestion, then diverted the conversation. Come. Let me show you my favorite feature of this room. Mainframe. Pull up the citadel on new, new earth. I broached dangerous terrain. Eslugai weren't to be educated, save for what they needed to know for work, but whatever. I'd come so far already. The view beyond the window swooshed from place to place, and together we glimpsed fragments of the archipelago. The wild azure wild beasts roaming the fields of Tarina R4. Glass-towered monasteries on Celeste S2. Woodlands and cottages and skyscrapers. These were not live feeds, but simulations real enough to make us feel we traveled colossal distances without moving a muscle. Bikbik remarked on each one, prodding me for extensive histories. Consulting the mainframe, if there was something I didn't know, devouring each description of humankind as if it were sacred. She asked about recreation, celebrations, and eventually family. Specifically mine. You and your papa only, and no more? She asked. I nodded, a lump forming in my throat. His song stirred in my innermost thoughts, and I tried to ignore it, but the words were persistent. When midnight stars ignite the skies, you're still the brightest in my eyes. Tara, Tara, oh starling mine. And all at once my heart sank under the ache of loneliness I carried my entire life. Down, down, down. A forgotten memory lurched forward and I saw Papa quietly slipping me a bowl of tenderly chopped coconut while I hunched in a corner over a stool that I called desk, despite what he felt about my studies. He always saved the best pieces for me. How proud he was of those coconuts he tended. We are custodians of legacy, he'd say, pride brightening his tawny eyes. These are the very coconuts that lived on old earth a seed bank, a DNA repository of flora and fauna carried by the original starship fleet as our ancestors fled to the stars from their withering, dying home. I shared that pride, too, for a time, gleaned as much as I could about our origins. And, oh, I begged him for a cat. Hadn't I? I begged him for months for a real cat from the stories. How had I forgotten that? Oh, <laughs> Lado, he chuckled, starling mine. Those types of pets are... Luxuries for the bigger planets, people with the money. No, only the coconuts are for us. But come, let me fill your betty with old earth coconuts, and maybe we shall catch a globe cricket for you later. Well, I was one of those bigger planet people now, wasn't I? Mainframe? I said in a croak. Set the view to Sukun Beach on Rea Onaim. And as I regaled Bic Bic with descriptions of warm sand against bare soles, the smoothly woven rumble of the sea, and coconut on the tongue, it struck me I hadn't only carried loneliness from my childhood. There was a little girl still tucked somewhere in my depths who had a little dream, 
and now I had the means to fulfill this dream of hers. That very evening, I dispatched an application through the network, thinking it would be months before an unclaimed kitten would be available, but perhaps serendipitously, one family withdrew their own application for one of a litter birthed on new new earth, and so, not a week later, I found myself cradling a garrulous kitten with curious yellow eyes and fur dark as coal. I called him Midnight. He quickly charmed his way into becoming the base's darling, whispers of how atypical it was for a station commander with no family to have a pet gave way to delighted squeals at how he sprawled belly up on warm perches or wiggled before pouncing on wind-up mice. Even my visits to the Eslugai had become less of a thing to scrutinize. The evening midnight somehow managed to get into a bowl of luminous pigment and then sprint helter-skelter through the caldera prompted collective, resounding belly laughter from all who looked on, Eslugai and human alike. He darted cultishly around fires under legs over rocks, teasing children to catch him, looking for all the world like some glowing ethereal creature, neon trails in his wake. My guffawing officers clapped each other on the back and pointed, especially Zaff, and when I beckoned an invitation with my stoople, they came. Cautiously, yes, and only a few at first, maintaining distance, but they came. This provisional, spontaneous harmony was not the only change roused by midnight. I found his quirks invoked a strange thrill in my heart. Coiling in his sleep, purring against my chest, mischievously testing gravity by knocking things off shelves. Big, hearty yawns. And within those simple, precious moments, the aches in my joints softened. Perpetual discomfort and grief stride hand in hand. Each day is a funeral a part of you laid to rest never to rise again. The little girl who darted across the sands without even a flicker of pain was alien to me. How had I ever been her? And Bic Bic recognized this, understood this more than I. The first song she ever taught me was a lament for things lost, even before I told her about my illness. Zaff found me unconscious in the corridor of my private yacht, drawn from the bridge by midnight's insistent yells. I lay there, recumbent and bruised in a puddle of my own piss. They'd been flying me to some interplanetary conference I could have easily attended virtually, but I just had to prove how dedicated and hardworking I was, pushing myself beyond physical limits because my being here wasn't a fluke. And so inevitably, devastatingly, a few months into my post, my long hours caught up to me. Zaff whipped the starship around and sprinted me to the medical dome on our moon base where doctors fussed over me until I came to mortified. Oh, this is it. Oh, giant goddesses above. This is it. I, I wasn't even religious. I waited with palpitating breath for my decommission to come. I waited even as a doctor simply attributed my lapse to an inhumanely congested schedule rather than some inherent fragility, even as they prescribed rest and nothing more, even if der I'd been confined to quarters and lay, defeated on my bed. The doctor's care and concern seemed genuine and not calculating, but still, I couldn't help agonizing over what was to come. I'd fainted from acute pain. Nothing could save me now. As my catastrophic thoughts churned, midnight grooming himself nonchalantly by my side as if it were an ordinary day, there was a gentle knock at my door. With an uneasy gulp, I gestured to the mainframe to convey, enter, because I had no energy to speak. Zaff poked their head in. Forgive me, Commander. I know you said not to disturb, but I thought you could use some cheering up. There's someone here to see you. I noted how they didn't even look slightly abashed at the non-apocalyptic disturbance, I was about to comment on their audacity when Bic Bic poked her head in above theirs. My mouth remained open. Zaff shrugged sheepish. Did you really think I didn't notice her visits? Don't worry, I've kept your secret. A short while later, I found myself being placed gently by Bic Bic's arms into a cradle of floor pillows she'd arranged. The iridescence from her scales against my mahogany skin reminded me in my hazed state of sunset glinting on coconut trunks. I could hear her rustling palm leaves and rolling splashes smell sea salt in a meandering breeze. Bic Bic hummed softly as she prepared, an easy practice movements. Chai, the way I liked it best, with cardamom and maluthi and a twinge of mint, 
pausing only to coo at midnight as he rubbed against her snake-like torso. Her hums had the low-soothing inclination of a reposeful tide at twilight, swathed in the early scents of tea, Bic Bic's hums, and midnight purrs, my body unclenched, and I drifted to sleep. When I awoke, I found a mug of chai by my side, still steaming on a heated plate. She kept it warm for me for whenever I rose. Somehow, the consideration behind the simple gesture made my breath catch. My gaze lifted to her dozing face, and as I noted her, I thought, with all the fervency of a swelling heart, how have I come to love this? This friend of mine. We must have spent hours like this, draped in Haigi, wafting in and out of sleep. Empty mugs mounding as we went from chai to watercress green to infuse jasmine, beloved cat alternately perching on our bellies. When we were both awake for a long stretch, Bic Bic sang softly under her breath without leaning into conversation as if she knew I hadn't the energy to talk. I do not know exactly when the piercing dread in my gut, that ominous fear of exposure, vanished. Teach me, I said finally, when I could find my voice. Hmm? I've heard you sing often enough. Perhaps it's time I learned. She thought for a moment, cocking her head, then began a tune I recognized. I sat up. Why this one? I asked, confused. Why not a birthday song or one of celebration? But she hushed me with a sharp finger, a teacher quieting a student, and so I learned. The S. Lugai Dirge. I attended the funerals, first out of obligation, then out of true sorrow, of those lost during mining accidents, occasions rarer than they would have been had humans' minds illuminate. S. Lugai, physiologies being more robust than our squishy flesh, but numerous nonetheless. And so the haunting tune was one I could identify instantly. A shy I tried to reproduce her silky tones, but I tripped over the notes. I scrambled to keep up, a newborn fawn fumbling after its mother. At the funerals, the song was elevated organ-like by a myriad harmonizing voices under the stars, resounding off the flinty edges of their caldera in a swirling crescendo. It seeped into my veins, raising the hair on my arms, beckoning tears that I curbed behind a stoic veil. After one particular funeral of an Esla guy far too young, I struggled to maintain that veil, risking embarrassment in front of the humans who accompanied me. Bic Bic squeezed my arm and ushered to Hualu, nudging her grandmother to distract me with conversation. Hualu translated the dirge. Loosely it bore the tale of stone dust carried away by the wind. A lament of things lost, sung from a stone's perspective, a stone who lived abundantly among her family, but who observed with each passing moment more, and more dust being lifted from her surface. Until aeons later, she and her loved ones were nothing more than pebbles, and aeons further, simply dust. A the moments we sang stretched beyond time, and soon my attempts evolved from stumbles to steadier treads until the tune flowed from me like a river. The first time I sang it through, and Bic Bic sat back with a satisfied expression, I cried. Remnants of music notes saturated the air, invoking a vision no longer of stone, but of me. Of many me's each year, each day, each moment, specks of normalcy snatched away over time as pain compounded. I was five when the initial pangs appeared. Back then, they came in short spells, only in my knees and head, but now, nearly two decades later, every single day it felt as though my heart pumped molten lead through my veins. The pain was constant. Each morning, a great gamble whether the day ahead would be bad or worse. I was terrified of the thought of burying this for decades more. 
This faceless entity that ravaged my body seemed to be slowly laying claim to every joint and muscle and angle as time ticked forward until a kaleidoscope of pain framed my skin like puzzle pieces snapping together by gnashing rifts. Another rift came to mind just then, a rift between father and daughter, and a relationship that could have been another victim of this chronic demon. In that moment, nestled on the floor with Big Big and Midnight, poignant notes still ringing in the air, words spilled from my mouth. More words than I'd ever shared with anyone, even Papa. Details and details of the true extent of pain, of the infinite pokes and prods as a child, of the burden of an illness that is invisible and not being taken seriously, of the anxiety that someone would discover the truth. And sees everything I'd worked so hard for. My father's exasperation, how little he believed in me. Back home, they called it the ache, I began. Or the forbidding capital A, slapped on to anything doctors couldn't explain. Pathetically romanticized and attributed to a genetic longing for old earth. An inherent saudade. Despite us having left our ancestral home many, many generations ago, but small communities are nothing if not prone to tragical, romantic notions and superstition. There were tests, of course, as many as we could afford from our poor health care and subpar facilities. Samples and scans and needles, all to say I was perfectly fine. And the neighborhood doctor, who couldn't very well officially diagnose me with ache, declared with authoritative certitude that it was just all in my head. Get some sun, eat ginger and turmeric and coconuts. Smile more instead of all this moping about, he said as he took the last credit we could spare. That was that, and my father believed him. Whatever it was that thrummed through my muscles, that fogged my brain, that swarmed my joints, I quickly learned to hide lest I be called too young to be sick, too healthy looking, and thus lazy. I conjured a mask that became my face. Ironically, the face that wasn't mine proved a boon in the end, for the academy would never have admitted a sicko. Most illnesses were easily cured by a sarcophagus. Those left over were not kindly looked upon. We didn't have a sarcophagus back home, I told Bick Bick in a trembling croak. Too fancy, too expensive. I encountered my first one at the academy, and I was wrought with emotions, you know? Hope. Could this thing cure me, maybe? Fear? What if they discovered I lied about my health and my application? Anger because I was born on a stupid nothing planet with stupid nothing facilities? I paused then, the results unspoken but thick and evident. The sarcophagus hadn't cured me, obviously. I didn't even know what I had. I was perfectly fine. Again. The daunting realization that I could never be rid of this enigmatic, nebulous thing that trawled my limbs was something I could not face. More and more, the words tumbled out, an avalanche of repressed heartstrings, even residual shame for not helping that lost ghost of a cadet in my second year. And Bick Bick simply listened. Oh, oh, how she listened. For once, the voice in the back of my mind that blared alarm that scared me into discretion and preached caution was silent. Something sparked the day I told Bick Bick. Barriers crumbled, floodgates unbolted. I discovered courage to make changes for myself, advocating for my needs without the pressure of explanation. Morning briefings shifted to afternoons, a greater number of tasks delegated, rest. And so the excuses to keep her in the dark about certain truths fell increasingly feeble, the protocols hollow and pointless. But I was selfish and arrogant. It wasn't enough for me to exhibit the archipelago through my windows and stories. No, I had the audacity to think I could physically take her to other places, for others to get to know her the way I did, that I could change the world. How magnificent is this archipelago of yours? Big Big would gush at the window, doe-eyed and exuberant. Each time she visited my quarters, we journeyed virtually to new places, and I regaled whatever tales and histories I memorized during my personal time. I expanded the mainframe's library to locations beyond its defaults, joined libraries on all major planets through the network, making note of anything I thought she may enjoy. And to think we are who make traveling among these wonders possible. 
I would see it all one day, couldn't I? She always asked, and I always thwarted the question, expert excuse maker that I was, but my words began striking dull even to my own ears. All the more after she learned I was chronically ill. Don't you think I'm no longer qualified for this role? Someone who can barely put together a concrete thought on a bad day is a pathetic excuse for a leader. I once asked her. She responded with genuine confusion and an acceptance shown in her eyes I'd never witnessed elsewhere. It was astonishing how much of my views of the Eslugai had shifted in such a short span of time. Things previously unthinkable came naturally to me now. Had I really once experienced discomfiture consorting with them? And I felt liberated, unfettered by preconceptions and protocol. I wished to spread this newfound gazellighead, soaking my heart. I imagined other humans opening their arms as they learn there is so much more than just us, us, us. Within months, I'd come to truly appreciate the Eslugai way of life. I ditched the roadsters to walk the mines, mingling with the workers and learning their names, despite my encumbering human entourage. I shared countless meals with them, clustered around their colorful communal fires, sipping sweetened stew. I painted with them on cave walls and stony ground. I sang with them not only when they implored the moon to loosen its luminite, but on birthdays, at funerals, on days that weren't special at all, but made special by spontaneous launch into collective symphonious song. And oh, the things I learned. Like their names. Once peculiar to my ignorant ears, their names had a moving significance. Each Eslugai was named after the very first sound she made. Little Bikbik -Bik made hers under the echo shaft. Her mother, killed in a mining accident long before I met her, sang an echo-laden lullaby to an insomniacal, restless toddler, and Bikbik -Bik responded. This penumbra of ignorance began to dissolve. I transformed how I ran the mines, painstakingly devising better systems and methods. There were fewer mining accidents now, and for a time my station thrived in near-perfect harmony. The only thing I did not reveal to Bikbik -Bik was the existence of other mining moons, other Eslugai. It wasn't exactly protocol that kept this cord cinched around my neck. It, I wasn't sure I could determine the gentlest way to sever it. At the academy, we'd been taught all the reasons to keep the Eslugai ignorant of their cousins. They're perfectly happy. There's a flawless symbiosis. Why potentially disturb a system that works? If they knew about the others of their kind, they'd want to meet, a group, their attention drawn away from their essential duties. They may wage war or grow jealous or all sorts of unpredictable consequences best not to let on too much, or so the narrative went. I no longer believed any of this. A thought sprouted within me, and over time its roots extended to every crevice of my mind. Well, why couldn't I take Big Big with me, show her the world, and in turn introduce Eslugai to the rest of humanity? We have much to learn from them. A year into my command, the cord finally snapped, for I was presented with the perfect opportunity, a conference intended for the smaller archipelagan mining moons. A humble consortium of my peers was to take place on the remote Mark X-21. I was to present the improvements I devised to run my station. The next time I snuck Bikbik -Bik to my quarters, Zeph and I were masters of discretion by then. I preempted her inevitable query to tour the archipelago with me. So I'm heading to another moon and I have a surprise for you. You want to come? I would never forget the way her eyes danced. Zaf and I conspiring spirited her away, my mind crammed with grandiose ideas of a new world. I had it all played out perfectly in my head, meet with other lower-ranking station commanders, introduce them to Bikbik, -Bik, arrange an audience with Mark X-21, Eslugai Queen, and then all together, functioning like a little collective of our own, we'd come up with some stellar plan, a petition maybe, to connect all Eslugai, to give them the choice of living and working elsewhere in the archipelago as true archipelagans, etc., etc., etc. So absorbed was I in my selfish fantasy of changing the world, of not considering what the Eslugai would want, I failed to notice immediately that something was very wrong. Ten minutes into our launch, we enter the nebula that clung close to our area of space, midnight perched on his favorite spot by the arched window. 
Bic Bic equally transfixed beside him. But she shook violently, and I did not notice until she knocked midnight off the sill a hair-raising moan rose from her throat. I slammed the emergency alert for Zaff. Pick, pick. Are you okay? Look at me. I grabbed what would have been her shoulder had she been human and squeezed, attempting to catch her rolling eyes. Presently, she quieted, and her shake ceased, but she stared dead ahead and milky-eyed right through me as if I were a ghost. Midnight circled Bic Bic's legs, pressing hard against them, rubbing as though her life depended on it, but she paid no heed, face eerily devoid of expression. Zaff barreled into the room. Bic Bic began to move toward the door as though she were a leaf caught in a rivulet, pushing past us with ease no matter how hard we tried to grab her arms. She seemed steered by some unseen puppeteer down the corridors. Zaff and I followed her gingerly, calling to her and exchanging panicked glances as we debated through silent, contorted expressions how to wrest her from this trance-like state. Midnight followed. It hit me suddenly, horrifically, the direction we headed. No. Stop! Big Big! Oh, blistered, withering earth, what are you doing? Big Big, please! I lunged for her. She shoved me reflexively without a glance, as though swatting a fly. The motion sent me flying, crashing into Zaff, and we hit the floor with a thud, which meant she had ample time to enter the decompression chamber, lock the door behind her, and initiate the airlock's countdown. Zaff and I tripped over each other in our scramble to the door. They pounded the control panel. I pounded at the door and shouted through the porthole glass, pleading with Big Big to come back inside. Just as the airlock count struck zero, she turned to me and our eyes locked. Recognition coursed into that look, but for a single precious instant. The door slid open behind her with a groan, and the ruthless maw of space snatched Big Big away. Abyssal. Dim nothingness. The next moment slowed as though time failed to breathe, stretched, silent, sludge-like. A vacant me hovered above my person, watching my physical body scream and wail and pummel the door as if that would make any difference. Cat crouched in a shadowed corner. I watched unfocused, shrouded in hollowness as if an audience to a forgettable play. A thought drifted into the blank. No, no, this can't be. This can't be how it ends. Zaff flung their arms around that other broken me, steadying so I wouldn't slump to the floor. Tears streaked their face too, but their expression wore the facade of strength. Through the porthole, we watched Big Big diminish into the nebula, a vision that would forever be seared behind my eyes. When she was a mere dot to our gaze, a blazing surge of light unfolded from where she faded, spreading outward in shimmering ripples, a galactic firework. The speckles twinkled in Big Big's colors, pink, purple, a twinge of yellow. Our breaths caught in our throats. Big Big had longed to explore the cosmos, I suppose in a way our wish came true. We stood there for eons of stretched, silent moments until the glimmers faded away. And so, Big Big's death is my fault and my extreme ignorance and arrogance. I killed her. I, I killed her. We anchored for hours in this damned starship in this tragic nebula, and I am all cried out. My vision is no longer blurred by my wetness, but my eyes are still swollen. My body aches from being crumpled over in grief. Joints scream. Blood hurls like boiling water. I move in increments as if the oxygen in my room has congealed into a stifling jelly. Blaring thoughts churn within my skull, and among them something clicks. Perhaps this is truly why they weren't to learn of their other mining moons, other Eslugai. They couldn't leave the moon because they die. Th this, this is all my fault. And then something more. I have to tell Walu her granddaughter is dead. How the hell would I find the courage? I trudged to the desk, pull out sheets of paper to write a letter, a real physical letter that would never bring Big Big back, but may indicate to Walu how dearly I loved my friend. Laughable and trite, yes, but what else could I do? I'd sent Zaff away to the bridge to await my signal. We must turn around and head back to the station, of course, but not quite yet. 
I'm not ready to face whatever comes next. Everything I pen down seems so cold, so impersonal. I ball up my paper, and then the next. Paper after paper after paper. My cat hops up to his favorite spot by the window to observe the nebula, the pitter-patter of his paws and the low hum rumble of the engine, the only sounds in the room. Misty tendrils amble past, glimmering and cloud-like carrying an entire medley of warm hues, and his black coat is gilded with a lambent pink. Midnight's tail flicks the way it does when I wind up one of his mice. I envy his contentment. I allow myself an unworried moment to imagine his thoughts pawing a star, perhaps, or snatching a fish from the great cosmic sea. Better to ruminate on midnight's fancies than face the task before me. The lump in my throat surges, and with it the pain that racks my limbs. I sigh, turning back to the metal ceramic slab that is my desk and the countless balls of paper that litter it. The desk protrudes from a metal ceramic wall, mirroring the protrusion against the room that holds my mattress. It strikes me how unimaginative our starships are, despite the alloy filigree and decorative trimmings compared to the nebula where we anchor under the glory of the cosmos beyond. I examine the sheet I'd been writing on, primed with empty, useless words. Blistered earth, I grumble, and crumple it up and hurl it against the wall. My joints protest. Midnight doesn't flinch at the movement. He's fixated on the sight beyond, occupied by his carefree cat thoughts. The tear tracks on my cheeks are dry now, and they itch. I scratch at them before pulling out another sheet. The waste isn't lost on me, but I blame my lack of articulation and not my decision to use real paper for a personal touch. It is the least I can do. I simply need to find the right words. But how can one really ever find the right words to tell someone their granddaughter is dead? And that too, someone who isn't human at all. How? The S. Lugai seem so connected to one another, more compassionate, empathic, and perceptive than humans can truly know. Conveying tragic news is difficult on any given day, but I think now of how the S. Lugai sleep together skin to skin, how seamlessly they join voices, with no prior rehearsal, how severely and collectively they mourn their dead, and I find myself at an utter loss for words. My mind paces over the funeral Bic Bic will never have, and their haunting dirge stirs in my mind. Hey, shy, lie, nigh, hanai, lie, nigh. I begin to hum the notes. The vision of a stone loosing its dust morphs into one of Bic Bic, and my heart aches with ponderous longing. I trace over the memories of the year gone by, Bic Bic's incessant questions and commentaries, shared snatches of secret laughter that twinkle in her eyes. Odd how someone can enter your life, but for an instance in the grand scheme of things, and yet change everything. Perhaps this is what I need to say. And so I begin to write on a fresh blank page, not condolences, but my story. I met Bic Bic the day I landed on the moon. I couldn't know then what she would become to me. When I finish an eternity later, I sit back and examine the sheets in my hand, then fold and tuck them into a pocket. I reach for my calm to signal our departure to Zaf, but midnight interrupts with those darling staccato chirps he makes whenever a simulated bird soars across the sky. I glance at him, curious. He hasn't moved from his perch by the window, still entranced by the nebula still, tail swishing. Oh, precious. You understand, don't you? You miss her too? I say, joining him, scratching behind his ears, forgetting my signal to Zaf. A flicker of movement catches the corner of my eye and I follow Midnight's gaze. Another flicker emits the ambling, lustrous clouds. Huh. Did... did you see that? I shake my head, rub my eyes, stupid grief-induced mind tricks. There's nothing out there, no movement save for ordinary nebulous swirls. But no. There it is again. 
This time closer, and again, I press my face to the window, and Midnight too leans forward, tail swishing, a marathon now. Then I see. A distinct stream of glimmering particles, pinks and purples, and a twinge of yellow? They coalesce loosely into a ribbon, a ribbon that seems to maneuver in a way more intentional than the drifts of the nebula. It heads straight for us. My chest heaves. Like ashes, perhaps? I murmur, my breath dewing up the glass. Human ashes are released into space after cremation, though I never heard of them behaving like this. Papa's face promptly appears before me, and I gently nudge him aside to study the approaching speckles. Not ashes, no. No, there is something very alive about this ribbon. My mind reels with a million possibilities, each more outrageous than the next. The ribbon pauses outside our window as if to meet our gaze. Rolling around in place with a frolicsome characteristic, achingly reminiscent of the twinkle in Big Big's eyes. Midnight is up on his hind legs now, paws pressed into the window, sniffing, sniffing, tail whipping delightedly. A tendril breaks free from the ribbon like a limb and seems to beckon, if that's even possible. I stumble back, dumbfounded, the tendril growing more insistent, pointing toward the left. Left direction of the airlock. Zaf! I shout, neglecting the moment to press the calm on my chest as I dart out the door and down the corridor. Midnight follows closely at my heels, and as I run, I glance at the windows flanking the passage. The ribbon follows alongside. I reach the airlock, panting because I'd forgotten to breathe. Most airlocks have lab functionality, a small compartment through which space debris and the light can be sampled without opening the entire door. I initiate this feature, watch as the ribbon comes to a halt just outside, and watch as a tiny fragment separates from the hole and enters willingly into the cavity. Wee Ribbon dances to its own cosmic tune, speckles glinting pink and purple and yellow under white overhead lights. Each time it approaches the container's edge, it pirouettes before flitting off in another direction. My forehead nearly collides with Zaf's as we hunch over, captivated in the cramped starship medical bay, further cramped by the sarcophagus installed soon after my fainting incident. It's like it's alive, whatever it is, Zaf whispers. I smell heavy peppermint and lavender on their breath, the tea they drink when anxious. How many liters... Must I have consumed waiting on the bridge for my signal to return home? Do you think it could be her, in, in a way? I say, equally soft. We are the only ones here, of course, but hushed tones seemed appropriate somehow. Reverend. I... Uh, we don't really know much about them, do we? Their eyes meet mine. The warm hazel reflects a glow from the dancing speckles and a heart-tightening regret. I know only too well. I shake my head, holding their gaze when there's a tug at my thoughts. A dawning. A smidgen of something like hope. I step lightly to the sarcophagus. Initiate its booting sequence. At their raised eyebrow, I say, This thing doesn't just heal, it assesses. If it is her, well, <laughs> definitely worth a try. They join me at the interface, clacking away at keys. You know there's a data bank in this too. Maybe it has something on the slugs? Eslugai, I correct reflexively, wincing inwardly at the tone. Harsher than intended, but Zaf pauses, frowns, and nods. Eslugai, yes. Once the sarcophagus warms up, its steady hum filling the air, we place the container gently inside and close the cylindrical hood. We signal the container to unclamp and watch the particles pool into the chamber from our screens. The diagnostic tool burrs for an intense few minutes. Presently, an alert pops up, conveyed by the ship's mainframe. Animated nebulacular particulate detected. Access code dust. Animated nebulacular particulate? Code dust? The hell is that? In the minutes after, we scour the network, abandon our hushed tones to debate heatedly, and even attempt to initiate code dust in the hopes that it would reveal information. Access denied. Please input the correct code. I finally land on a decision hushing Zaf's disapproval with a stern look. 
I place a call to the medical director on our moon base. Audio only. Zaf's brow furrows with concern as the steely voice of Dr. Shelley comes on the line. Yes, Commander. What can I do for you? Dr. Shelley, do you know anything about code dust? Silence, save for the beeps and buzzes of the medical dome, followed by sounds of shuffling, then more silence. Uh, forgive me, Commander, her voice returns with a slight, uncharacteristic shake. I had to relocate to my office. Discretion is necessary? She continues to speak, and we learn three things. One, there is a classified protocol not taught at the academy, but accessible to station commanders, should the need arise. Two, Dr. Shelley is unaware of the particulars of said protocol, save for her being required to provide a code when asked. And three, no one had invoked code dust in over a hundred years. The doctor is reluctant at first to provide the code, needlessly drilling me about the on-screen alert and what the sarcophagus holds. Oh, just a bit of debris we picked up, nothing really. But her curiosity gets the better of her. When I input the code, I am taken through a series of identification tests to ensure that I am, as I say, Commander Tara Jack Singh. When the final screen appears and the particulars of Code Dust are unlocked, all the color drains from my surroundings. One harrowed glance at Zaf indicates they feel the same. I cut the call, block all incoming, rigging it to look like a faulty connection. My lungs feels a void of air and I reach for Zaf's hand to steady myself as much as to steady them. With clutched, trembling hands and fractured, halting breaths, we ingest the information on the screen. You know, I never questioned whether the Eslugai are native to our mining moons. Uh, they were here first, but it turns out they weren't. We were. We brought them here. Before the Eslugai, it was humans who mined the Luminite, our frail physiologies prone to mishaps, causing extensive loss of life despite considerable technological strides. The casualties were regrettable yet unavoidable. Luminite was far too important as the driver of our archipelago. But nearly two centuries ago, cosmologists studying the various nebulae that spangled our archipelago discovered something magnificent by sheer happenstance. Sentients in the cosmic dust. Animated nebulacular particulate, they soon discovered, congealed into a physical form when succumbed to certain types of pulses. An amiable, pliable, robust form, much more robust than any human could ever dream to be. Elongated, many-limbed, scaled. The Eslugai. It seems as time passed, in their new homes and their isolated collectives, the Eslagai have forgotten they've come from elsewhere. They belong in else form, despite what they call themselves loosely translating to. Oh, bloody earth. Stardust. The Eslugai are stardust. When I was five, Papa brought home a pair of goggles that must have cost a fortune. You're curious about these things and such like, na, nah, let home. Want to go outside and look around? After a month of being told by doctors I was perfectly fine, I spent countless days sulking under bed covers, cocooned in bewilderment and gloom. I didn't feel perfectly fine. Why didn't anyone believe me? Papa tried everything to lure me from the sheets, from food to gifts to scolding to love. In the end, goggles did the trick. For a time, at least, the goggles could wavelength shift and exhibit the world through an entirely different being's eyes. Infrared, black and white, yellows and blues, any biologically authentic combination. I spent long hours under the sun viewing the shore as a cat, a bullfrog, a grouse, baboon. I think of those goggles now suspended in horror and verity under the artificial illumination of the medical bay because the colors in my universe lurch and distort. It is as if I see through completely different eyes, as if a leaden mist descended, or maybe a curtain lifted. The Eslugai were of the cosmos all along, and people not only forced from their true homes, but lied to, manipulated, their truth malformed, their history erased as though they never existed in any other way than they do now, and blistering, withering, bloody earth... They are convinced of their joy in providing for us. Ugh. I feel sick in a whole new way. I knew humanity was capable of heartlessness from treating the chronically ill as less than to making their own children anguish over their place in the world. But 
this? This is truly beyond unconscionable. And all at once, the collective beliefs and experiences spanning my life fade into dullness and my entire reality amalgamates into a single fierce thought. I must act. Zaf and I returned to the station in a deluge of solemnity, silence, and determination. They craft a plausible report about our hasty return, blaming technical difficulties. Dr. Shelley pummels me inquisitively about code dust, but I feign nonchalance, imply a computer glitch, even laugh a little before I scurry off. May as well tackle my pending duties now that I'm back. <laughs> I arrange an impromptu briefing with the Eslugai Queen under the unsuspect pretext of protocol reviews. I've done this before. When I greet Walu, she looks about for Bikbik -Bik with slight confusion. I give her a gentle, reassuring nod with my assistants shuffle out, led away by Saf. And then I tell her the truth. All of it. When I finish, she is quiet, expression seemingly unchanged, but a hum rises from within her depths that pebbles my skin. Onward. Onward. Presently, she murmurs, I see, and what became of my big big? At this, I smile, recalling the particulates apparent glee as Zaf and I release them back into the nebula, like water droplets eager to return to Mother Sea. Up there, I say. We sent her back. Walu nods sharply with what I perceive as approval in my heart twitches. There's a cargo ship set to depart tomorrow after midnight, I continue. She studies my face. I know this is short notice, but the next isn't due for another two weeks, and who knows what may happen between then and now. If you're willing, if this is your wish, you, all of you, can board it. I tell her how even access of the classified protocol requires authorities to be alerted, and there's no telling what Mining General Patel Cruz would do if he found we discovered it, or worse, that we contemplate sending the Eslugai home. I would not alert him, of course, and neither would Zaf, but Dr. Shelley is ever the stickler of protocol I once was, something I cannot really begrudge her. I know it is only a matter of time before she sends him a message. Perhaps she's done so already, and I am none the wiser. Wahlu stays silent, contemplative, but there's a slight listness to her I've never seen before. Her scales faintly shimmer and color shift as if she shuffles weight from one foot to another and back. The pair of whiskers that frame her maw quiver. I will need to convey this news to my people, she says finally, and think with them of the path ahead. As you spake, it is as if a lantern lit in my heart that I did not know I carried. All these years it was there and I did not know. I want to throw my arms around her and ball, but I maintain a respectful distance as she wrangles with a torrent I cannot truly comprehend. Yes, I understand. You must convey the news to them. You must decide together, I say. And Walu? I am sorry. I am so very sorry. Despite my countless years of practice, I have trouble retaining my composure over the next day and draw strength from Walu's resilience in the face of such a harsh truth. I am restless, riddled by my desperation as I go about duties and await her answer, knowing it is not my place to plead with them to abandon the lives they've known for generations, to fly free into the stars as much as I want to. In the meanwhile, Dr. Shelley does alert Patel Cruz, and his projected face looms before me in a conference but his expression is one of concern and not contempt, and I use this. Let me understand. You're saying it was all a glitch, you hacked into the system, and that's how you found these classified files, he says, eyebrows furrowed. Only he and his superiors know the particulars of code dust. Pretty much. I was curious and decided to peruse the sarcophagus's data bank. A little bit of coding here, a little bit of hacking there, and I ended up discovering a backdoor to read everything. 
I hang my head in what I hope passes for shame. And how did you feel after you read it? His tone is casual, but his eyes pierce. I shrug. I haven't really thought about it, though it makes sense, I guess. I'm just honored to serve in this role. He buys it. He buys it because, as once valedictorian, I must be the epitome of patriotism and skill. He buys it because I somehow managed to improve systems on my moon within the first year of my appointment. He buys it because I boldly wear the face he expects to see. I, I find I do not falter in front of him even once. Steady words. Steady hands. All right, but I must insist you do not share this information with any of your peers. The less we know, the better. I suppose in a way it's a good thing you found a bug so we can patch it up. He leans back with a sigh. The knots in my shoulders unclench and I too sigh a sigh of relief. Almost serendipitously, a message pings through my private comms from Zaf. It's a yes. A yes. Oh, Walu says yes. I school my face into one of pleasant neutrality, masking my jubilation. I bid Mining General Patel Cruz a good day and move to disconnect the call. But then he says something that punctures my gut, and I realize he doesn't actually buy it at all. He says, voice threaded with suspicion, I haven't visited your moon since you began. I might as well visit now and check up on things. I guess it's been my schedule for a day. I'm not too far away. I'll be there tonight. I distinctly remember the moment I received word of Papa's death. The Viridian-streaked sky of Celeste S1, home of the Academy, was bleary and overcast, but there was a tranquility to the breeze rustling through the greenery-laced outdoor extension of the Academy cafeteria. The space was a welcome respite from the bustle indoors, overlooking a sea of towns and hills. I'd received my Mark X-5-2 assignment that very afternoon, and with no one to celebrate with, I sequestered a corner of the table in a cozy view, relishing in the warmth of the taric and cinnamon-soaked dumplings. And finality came through my headset just then, a message flagged urgent, and attached with it the paperwork to apply for emergency leave. My forefinger was perfectly steady as I pressed decline, but it wasn't my finger. Couldn't have been mine, because I'd suddenly dropped into a whirlpool overwrought with maniacal creatures floundering floundering. So, he succumbed to his injuries. I, she whispered aloud, aloud because I desired so desperately to cling to cold indifference and refusal to acknowledge this meant anything to me. But these emotions didn't exist, the plundering, distraught, the guilt, the disbelief, the saudade, memory, flashes of warm sands and playful seas, a song in the air, and laughter. I knew there'd be some sort of a- I knew there'd be some sort of accident a few days before that alert too was accompanied by a paperwork link. Apparently he'd asked for me. I declined immediately. My last conversation was a year prior to that moment after my undergraduation ceremony wherein I was declared valedictorian, a shoe-in for a great position selected for the elite command program. He voiced his congratulations, followed by a ping into my account with a few credits I knew he couldn't spare. I couldn't find the words to tell him I didn't need his money. I would make more in a year than he would in half his lifetime. It veered too close to my no longer needing him, something I wasn't ready to let him hear even though I had come to believe it. But then came the words. Now you don't have to pretend anymore. A pause. What? The tiniest, ever so tiny flicker of hope and wonder. Had he seen through my elaborate masking all along? Did he really understand me after all? Your sickness. The ache. It was an excuse in case you failed, no? But see, you had it in you all along to shine. So go. Go shine, starling mine. No need to fear your own light. I cut the call and blocked his every attempt to reach me after because I could deal with those forbidding mountains later, much later, after I completed my postgrad, after I got my assignment, after he recovered. 
after I had time to think after, 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 or so I told myself with the potent cocksure of a child who assumes their own parent is immune to the snare of memento mori. But then came the pivotal, grievous moment at a corner table under the blurry sky of Celeste S1. Consumed by anger, regret, relief that I no longer had to ponder reconciliation, the choice had been made for me, and guilt at having felt relief at all, I poured my entire focus into the shiny station commander role I arrogantly assumed was my life's purpose. More important than fragile connections and strained paths affording no spare thought to Rea 09 until that first day I entered my private quarters. Yet now, for some reason, on the brink of upheaval and uncertainty, my thoughts are drawn to that moment. I can almost taste warm, tetheric, and cinnamon. The moment stretches across my thoughts like a soapy film, and anything I try to think must pass through its lurid surface. The rustling breeze, the blinking headset, the lurches in my heart, the memories of sunshine and sand. So I gaze at Sakun Beach on Rea 09 through my window, the serenity of a silver-blue afternoon sea, an anti-mirror of my thoughts, arms clasped around midnight, pressing my cheek into the soft hollow of his neck, drinking in his purrs. If I listen closely, I can hear familiar words, and this time I don't chase them away. When midnight stars ignite the skies, you're still the brightest in my eyes, Tara, oh. Tara, 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 oh starling mine, my Tara shines the brightest light. I lift my gaze to meet the eyes of my translucent reflection, riddled with shame and regret and longing and the resolution to no longer remain a stubborn, passive observer of my own story. The tectonic shift in my demeanor once I'd learned from the Eslugai truth. Mainframe, remove simulation. I whisper. The bright scene swishes to the flinty expanse of the moon. The nebula is visible from here, a faintness in one corner of a raven sky wild with stars. And though he's in reality too far away, I feel if I squint hard enough, I can see the fleck that is mining General Patel Cruz's starship hurtling towards us because code dust was accessed. I'm supposed to rest... A quick pause after the swarming hours setting plans in motion with Walu and Zaf. A few quiet moments until it is the precise time for me to head to the control tower while vehemently hoping Patel Cruz won't reach us before we are done. But rest does not come, and adrenaline pounds in my ears. My mind explodes with Papa, Bic Bic, Celeste S1, Papa, the S Lugai, Rhea 09, Patel Cruz, Papa. I pull away from midnight and notice wetness on the fur. When I started crying. No matter. It's time. Mainframe, I say. Invoke protocol Starling. Authorization, Jack Singh Alpha 1-4. Acknowledged. I head out the door midnight in tow. Zaf falls in staff behind me. A neon projection of the station's map hovering above the tablet in their hand. Some parts flash purple, indicating closing bulkheads. I strategically program to divert foot traffic. People dots scamper in fluorescent corridors, pausing in surprise, then taking longer routes to their destinations. How long? I ask. Zaf swipes to radar display. Patel Cruz will be here within a half an hour, Commander. My breath stutters. He approached much faster than we anticipated. He must have upgraded to one of those cruiser-class ships. We were cutting it dangerously close. And the Asla guy? Another swipe. Not quite there, but almost. Five minutes tops, if all goes well. If all goes well. The station's mainframe is programmed to obey my orders, so unless someone spontaneously decides to check the operations logs, we'd be safe. For now. When everything comes to light, the logs will be scrutinized and shredded. Will be scrutinized and shredded. I coded a pathway for the Eslo guy to reach the hangar from the mines, falsifying and removing employee shifts so posts were abandoned, discreetly maneuvering barriers. But if someone returns to their post to fetch something, or to converse with a colleague they assume would be there, that would be it for the Eslo guy. 22 minutes. Patel Cruz's speck in the projection draws ever closer. 
We hurry toward the control tower, slowing down for passerby, then picking up speed when they disappear around a corner. When we are only a couple of corridors away, an alarm peals. The panels on the walls and ceiling flash red, and a panicked voice blares through the calm on my chest. One of the mine supervisors. Commander Jackson, the slugs have all deserted the mines. I shoot Zaff a look, a silent inquiry. They've reached... I release a breath. We ask the guy are inside the hangar. At this moment, Walu would be loading them on board the cargo vessel, taking care of any officers who happened to remain behind with the stunner I'd slipped to her before we parted. In the calmest voice I can muster, I hit the comm and say, Acknowledged. Stand by. And then I switch my calm off. The final corridor leading to the control tower, the more elevated dome than tower, is transparent from the waist up. We can see the bright spot that is Patel Cruz's ship growing bigger in the starlit sky. My calm erupts just then, overridden, and Patel Cruz's gritty voice roars through, clearly alerted to the alarm. Tara Jackson, what in the giant's ass do you think you're doing? And though my pulse pounds a sinister marathon, I ignore him. Faint thumping sounds from somewhere behind us indicate boots heading our way. As we approach the final bulkhead... I halt abruptly and turn to Zaff. The thumping boot procession grows louder. Turn back. What? You can't do this alone. I'll stay with you. I'll... I grab their hands, meet their eyes with fierceness I did not know I had. Someone needs to take care of Midnight. They quaver, swallowing a gulp. Boots echo ferociously. They look from me to my beloved cat who twists about our halted legs. And finally, mercifully nod. Good. Now forgive me. I barely register their puzzled look before I punch them hard across the face, siphoning all the intensity of my prismatic thoughts. They yelp and fall back, and I think, I hope that bruises. I choke a little while grabbing Midnight, squeeze him so hard he tries to squirm away, then toss him gently into Zaff's direction. It feels as though I've torn out my heart and smashed it against the floor, but I swallow and press on because there's no turning back now. Tell them you tried to stop me, I say, spotting the teal blurs of security enter the far end of the corridor. I dart through the bulkhead. It slams shut behind me and locks with a satisfying clap. The control tower is capped by a glass dome cast into octants of night sky. Under the starry expanse, I pelt away at the consults, tightly monitoring the screen's spread half moon before me. Wahoo's voice finally crackles through the tower channel, and the sound is all the honey in the universe to my ears. I release a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. She made it to the ship's bridge. All Eslugai accounted for. Good. Good. It was the first I'd heard from her. Calm devices were trackable. Stunners were not. I initiate the remote launch sequence, guiding Walu in the ways of autopilot. My personal comm sparks and buzzes where it lies on the floor smashed by the heel of my boot. There's clanging at the bulkhead now, security trying to enter manually. Somewhere in the station, computer engineers would be attempting to hack into the mainframe and fracture my programmed barriers. They were better than I, of course, so they'd get in eventually, but I hoped I bought us enough time. The hangar... Skylights open and the cargo ship rises starward. It gleams in a coat of bronze, looking for all the world like a little star itself. A starling. Tara, Tara, oh starling mine, my Tara shines the brightest light. Strangely, the words settle on my shoulders with the warm comfort of a beloved childhood blanket, even though Patel Cruz's ship is no longer a speck but a bulldozer to the naked eye. The words swathe and soothe, even though my chest convulses in anticipation, even though the bulkhead begins to groan under stress. There is nothing for me to do now but wait. Wait and watch, eyes peeled on the bronze starling, racing to the cosmos and a mammoth of ship that alters course to follow in its wake. Neon flashes emerge from Patel Cruz's vessel, photonic weaponry. My muscles clench, joints quiver. I steady myself by sinking to my knees, white-knuckled and strangling my braid, unable to tear my eyes from the sight above. Come on, come on, come on. Patel Cruz's ship is faster, of course, and though he's too far for the weapons to have any impact, it's only a matter of time. The gap between the two ships narrow by the instant and my heart judders. I've 
I've made a grave mistake, haven't I? I failed. Failed like I always knew I would, blindly intoxicated by my audacity to achieve. How the hell did I believe I could do this? Nothing will change, and I have doomed Big Pix people. Papa was right, comes the right thought. I shouldn't have been a coconut farmer. No. No, I don't really mean that. But my temple's smart. Something else emerges from among my broiling thoughts, tugging lightly at first, and then with more persistence. My father's face in our last conversation. He called my illness an excuse, something I consumed as unquestionable proof he had no comprehension of me as a person at all. I latched on to that thorn, abandoning all else because it is what I expected to hear from him deep down. A thorn that overrode any other words he spoke, attributed to what I assumed were his limited views and generational small-town biases. But hadn't I been guilty of those very things myself? My eyes were closed the day I stepped onto the moon, and I faltered my way into opening them, all because Bic Bic dignified me space to grow. I think now of fancy goggles, tenderly cut coconut pieces, Papa's tears of joy when I left for a better life. How his song strangely comforts me in this moment, and it strikes me like a slash through my chest. I never gave him even a sliver of the grace afforded to me. All along, Papa had tried, in his own way, to connect, to understand, to bridge the rift I was so convinced was well-placed. My heart sinks. And yet, he said something else, too, on that last day, didn't he? No need, no need to fear your own light. So... He believed in me in the end, or perhaps he always had. A spark ignites from this tragic realization, as the gap between the two ships shrinks further, despite the cargo ship being only a hair away from the nebula now. It occurs to me things don't have to end like this, not here. From my pockets, I recover the folded sheets of my story and feed them into a scanner. A few taps on the console and the freshly digitized words are joined by a copy of code dust I'd tucked away in my private database. In a single swipe, I render these files public and release them into the network. Thank you, Papa. I look up just as a barrage of weaponry expands from Patel Cruz's ship, and my gut tightens as it gazes the tail end of the cargo ship. But the cargo ship continues onward, limping to a nebula that seems to sparkle invitingly. I think of Big Big. Does she know her family is trying to reach her? Somehow? Papa's ashes would be out there too somewhere. Dismantled atoms, returned to stars after death. Formless and free without the bounds of a physical body, putrefying with aches and age like dust, gleaning off a stone in the drifts of time. Dust. It seems at the end of the day we aren't so different from the s guy, are we? Papa would have loved that. He and I could not see eye to eye in this life, but perhaps in the next we will. For Papa, for the Eslu guy, and for me, I begin to sing an ode to Sardust. Hey, shy, lie, lie, lie. The bruised and smoking cargo ship disappears into the nebula's embrace and my voice swells with hope even though Patel Cruz is close behind. The bulkhead groans under colossal strain and shouts erupt through its micro-cracks. I continue to sing. Surprisingly, there's no longer a shred of agitation in me, not even the usual weighted anticipation of pain to come. Prison or worse would not be a kind place for the chronically ill, but where there was once a perennial maelstrom, I only find peace.
Just before Patel Cruz disappears into the nebula, there's an explosion of scintillating light, as if the nebula exhales a great, radiant breath. Swirls of very colored hues diffuse through the cosmic cloud, a thousand flickering dias lit across a festive sky, and my pulse reverberates in euphoric beats, untethering in me a glorious lightness. They made it. Oh, they made it. They made it. The dirge sweeps into a life of its own resounding relief and joy and love. I am a feather riding in a regal wind singing to the heart of the universe itself. Untethered, feathery me draws in, 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 and though I am drawn inward, the feeling is not of collapse nor contraction, but rather a liberation. The blinking screens and consoles, the cold metal ceramic furbishing, the thunderous shouts and clangs, the starry night above all melt away from me like water dousing a sand castle. I blink under dazzling sunshine. My bare feet sink into warm russet sands, the eyes. The sun's rays splash across a joyous silver blue sea. Coconut trees sway to the whoosh of playful waves. I hear soft crackles along with an achingly familiar voice and turn to see Papa tending a small fire in the sands, a copper kettle hoisted above for tea. Midnight leaping from log to log, chasing a speckle ribbon of pink and purple and a twinge of yellow, making Papa laugh. Weightlessness takes hold of me, and I run, run toward them, run, 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 and my joints do not so much as twang with each step I forget. Something, another life, another me, things that were perhaps important, but in this moment seem devoid of note. I do not even remember I'm supposed to be in pain. I shrug away those insignificances because all that matters is here and now. The three who await me, the lolling waves beyond, the ambling clouds and a jade albatross in the sky above. Somewhere. In the far distance are echoes of metallic doors crashing open, buzzes and alarms and shouts. But those have nothing to do with me. An errant thought materializes in the far distance that perhaps could have been my own, but it is so far removed it may as well be from someone else entirely. The thought spreads above the firmament. Far, far away and scatters into a million inconsequential pieces. Whatever. Let them come. Thank you for joining us on this story. We have a few more short stories left for you for the month of February. I hope you do come back and listen, should you so choose. And until then, my dear listener, I bid you a very fond and hopefully very, very temporary farewell. <laughs>